It's, a, it's amazing to look out on so many thousands of, of people, steeler, steel workers. Uh, the best thing that's ever happened to us is our alliance with the United Steel Workers Union. It's changed the way we work, and we can work harder with the steel workers at our backs and we're at the back of the steel workers. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the developing world and just run through some stuff, just anecdotes. On November 24th of 2012, a fire broke out in a factory called Tazreen. It was a nine-story building. There were 1,800 workers in it. It was 6.30 at night, and in Bangladesh, it's pitch dark at 6.30 at night. And a fire broke out. There were no fire escapes. There were no emergency exits. There were just three internal stairways that went down the nine stories. And those, those three stories, those walkways, led right down to the warehouse which is the most dangerous place in the world in these factories. Because they're supposed to be removed from the factory and they're supposed to be in fireproof rooms. These workers went down the stairs, the guards locked the gates, 1,800 people, they tried to come down, but the gates were locked. Floor after floor after floor, they pulled down the collapsible gates. They locked the 1,800 workers in the factory. Within a half an hour or so, the thing was an inferno. 112 workers were burnt to death. 53 of the workers were burnt so badly, they couldn't recognize their face, their bodies. They had to be buried in a common grave. The workers were trapped. There were locked windows. The gates, like I said, were locked. The lights went out. They're in pitch darkness. They can't breathe. They can't see. They started to jump off the roof. They started smashing the windows. They tried to climb down. Hundreds of workers jumped and were de and very badly injured. This meant nothing. The owner of the factory, Delwa Hussain, is scot-free. After killing 112 workers, he's work walking around scot-free, and his new project is to bring work from China to Bangladesh and then send it to the United States and pull the sweatshop stuff into the United States. He's on scot-free, but these other workers are killed. This is Walmart. Walmart was in the factory. Walmart wouldn't give the workers one cent. They said, oh, well, we really didn't mean to have them in that factory. So they, the most powerful retail in the world wouldn't give the workers who died and who were burnt to death, wouldn't give them one single cent, said it's not our obligation. The workers were burnt so badly that they had to be buried in a common grave. They couldn't be identified. You know what the workers got paid? 12 cents. 12 cents an hour, 22 cents an hour. The highest wage is 26 cents an hour. They work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. They get no breaks. They have no union. They have absolutely nothing. It was horrifying to hear these young workers in the pitch darkness choking to death. They had their cell phones, and they were calling their parents and saying goodbye to them. Remember us, young kids with their cell phones talking to their parents, we're gonna die. And nothing happens. There's no, they had to be buried in this common grave. There's no laws.
I want to go on to Rana Plaza that people spoke about. Rana Plaza, it's also on the outskirts of Dhaka in, in Ashulia. This also was an eight or, this building had like five, five, eight levels in the Rana Plaza building. It was built illegally by a very corrupt politician, Sohil Rana. It was illegally built. They didn't use enough concrete. They dumped in more sand. And they built this big building with thousands of garment workers inside this building. Shoddily built. Illegal. It was April 22 on a Monday, 2012, 2013. April 2013, on a Monday, the workers saw their actual factory had big cracks in it. The cracks were like six inches wide, and some of them were several feet long. The workers could look right through the building. And so they left the building that Monday, and they came down, thousands of workers. And they said, we can't go into this building, it's going to collapse. On Tuesday, the 23rd, they refused to go into work. They came back on Wednesday, April 24th, and the workers were milling around thinking, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with our wages? What's going to happen with our jobs? And all of a sudden, gang members showed up. And the corrupt Shahil guy, Rana, he showed up. And the garment factory owners, they showed up. And they said to those women, if you don't go into that factory, you will not get paid for the month of April. That means they're going to starve to death. They live from hand to mouth. They don't even have enough money to get through the, the month. So the, the garment owners said, if you don't go in, you're probably going to starve. It's up to you. And the workers were, were fighting and, and crying. And then the gang guys came in, the gangsters, the gang members with poles and sticks, and started to beat the workers, young women, beating them with canes. And they drove them up into the factory. They had no choice. Thousands of workers went up into the Rana Plaza building. Its work started at 8 o'clock. At 8.45, the electricity went out. And automatically, all of the generators went on. On every single floor, these giant generators went on. And it started to shake the whole building. The vibrations started to shake. 8.45, the building collapsed completely, pancaked from the back down. Thousands and thousands of workers were trapped. One thousand one hundred and thirty workers were killed. The worst industrial disaster in the history of the world in the garment industry. One thousand one hundred and thirty workers killed, crushed to death. Thousands more badly maimed, injured. Body after body. Many of the workers still have not been found. Hundreds have not been found. They were pulverized when the, when the factory collapsed like that. It was 100 degrees that day. 100 degrees, 102 degrees. It went on, the, it went on for two weeks to try to rescue more workers. You could smell the stench of death everywhere. We were there. You could smell the stench everywhere of rotting flesh of human beings of young women. To this day, parents are going around with pictures of their children, begging, do you know where she is? There's still all of these hundreds of people missing, not accounted for. It's beyond belief what people have done to each other. We went into the hospitals. This is what it looks like. 
the arms missing, the arms missing, the legs missing. Worker after worker after worker maimed. Their lives are over. There's no place in Bangladesh like a sidewalk. You can't have a wheelchair. There's nowhere to go. There's not even stairs to go up and down. This is one of the worst crimes perpetuated by the garment industry. I want to thank you because I'm going to let you know your support of the steel workers. You allow us to go to places like this. You allow us to fight for these women. Because of your donations, we're putting these women to school so they can build their lives again. This woman's a genius. She just never had a chance to work. She never had a chance to work a decent job. So now she's going to go back to school. She's sharp, sharp as a whip. She's going to survive because of you. And there's going to be dozens and hundreds of people like her. We have to make these workers whole again. And we've got to go after these retailers. We work with this union leader, Sajan. They were there first, right on the streets, fighting, making all lists up. If it wasn't for those union guys and women, we wouldn't know anything about who was killed because they would just bury them and throw them away. So you've got good people there in Bangladesh who are at your backs, and we're working together with them. I want to talk quickly just about shipbreaking. That also happens in Bangladesh. They just take the biggest tank of ships in the world that are decommissioned, and they drive them up onto the beaches of Bengal. And kids go in, young people go in, and they dismantle the ships with their bare hands. It's hard to imagine. There's fires constantly. Children workers in fil filthy dormitories, little kids. No safety gear, they have sunglasses. They put on two sets of shirts, they don't have any Asbestos vests, they have nothing. Go faster with this. And you can see the burn marks on these workers. Burnt to death. I want to stop for a second. This guy, Mezaudin, a young worker, he was out in the field when they were pulling up a big piece of the ship. And the cable was dragging it, a huge cable. And all of a sudden, the cable snapped. And it hit Uden in the back and broke his backbone. 22 years old. He can't walk. He can't sit up. If he eats, he doesn't have any sensation. He never knows if he's going to the bathroom or not. He's 100% paralyzed from the neck up, and he can move his arms a tiny bit. They threw him out of the factory, and he spends his entire life just laying in this bed. It's crime. It's filthy. I want to go on to this guy, 14-year-old kid. Kurshad. He went to work to help his parents. 14 years old. They put the kids on the night shift because they don't want the, the kids to be seen. So he worked from 7 o'clock at night until 7 o'clock in the morning. 14-year-old kid. They're outside. They're on the sand and in the mud. And they're dismantling these gigantic ships. And they pulled up a big iron plate off of the, one of the ships. And him and, the, and this, the, the man with the cutter, they were there, 3 o'clock at night. And they were blowtorch, using a blowtorch to cut this slab. Kershad was standing in six inches of mud in his bare feet, 
holding up the, the slab. And it was the monsoon season, and a wave, a wave of wind came. And it crushed Kershaw to death. The plate fell on him. It took 30 people to pick the plate up, and he was dead. And they picked it up. The kid was dead. His wages were 22 cents an hour. You know what they gave him? You know what the owner gave him? $244 for his life. And said goodbye. This, this is what's going on across the global economy. Right now, because of you, because of the steel workers, and having the steel workers at our back, the workers are trying to organize. The workers are organizing. But because of you, they're getting some safety gear, stuff they've never in their lives have ever seen before. No one had ever talked to them before. No one had ever asked them a question before. They were just slaves. And now they want a union. Ha, huh? how do you like that? They want a union. They want to have union workers uniting. But these, but the government, these guys got guts. These guys want to fight. These women want to fight. These are smart people. They may be poor, but they're smart. And they're the hardest workers in the world. But it's so damn corrupt that when they organized three unions for $20, the boss could go into the Ministry of Labor, give him a $20 bill, and said, give me all the names of the people who are in the union. For $60, they destroyed three unions. This is the kind of shit that goes on. But they're coming back again. This fight ain't over. It's not over yet. I want to end with a, a great hero, Aminul Islam. He was a worker in Bangladesh in a giant gobbin factory outside of Savar. And after a bunch of years of working in the factory, he became a union organizer. And I'm a rule would tell the workers, if you have a problem, come to me. I, I may not be able to help you in every single way, but we're going to work with you. We'll do every single thing we can. Well, we were in Bangladesh when he disappeared. He was working on a big case at, at Nike. The next day, this is how he was found. They tortured him to death. They beat him. And they drove a spike through his knee. And then they broke his toes and his feet. And then they threw him into a six-inch grave. The, the Bangladesh government can't even find out who killed this person. We know it was the police. Police and the military, they killed him. But I just want to say that there's a lot of bad stuff going on. These are more, more young kids killed in smart fashion factory. I could go on and on and on. I've never in my life met anybody like the steel workers. It's the best thing that's ever happened to us. It's amazing to be able to work with you. We pinch ourselves every single day. Is this possible? I've never seen a union like this. We will never stop fighting for these workers, whether it's in Bangladesh, whether it's in Honduras, whether it's in Guatemala or China. We will never stop. And I'll let you know something. We've just caught the gap in Old Navy in Bangladesh, and we finally deciphered their crooked operation. All the workers, thousands, 30,000 workers get pay stubs, but the pay stubs are phony. 
They throw those things away and the workers keep working until two or three o'clock in the morning, almost every single night. And they get paid in cash. This whole thing is a conspiracy. In broad daylight, The Gap, one of the largest apparel companies, is in bed for the last two and a half years with a crime. Lying, subterfuge. The workers have absolutely no rights, zero. They live in miserable one room of hovels. They have no right to a union. They have no right to have a voice. We're going to kick the shit out of them. Within the next few days, we're working with the Wall Street Journal. When it kicked the shit out of them, they're going to have to get some respect for these workers' rights. And again, I just I want to thank you for everything that you've done for us, everything you've done for workers in the developing world. You're gold. You got God at your back. Thank you.